the source of the subject matter that I'm preaching on tonight, of course, still has to do with the events that just happened this week in Steadfast Baptist Church with Pastor Romero stepping down. And the reason why I'm spending so much time on this, even though they're completely independent from our church, it's still a big event and, and we can learn a lot from this. And one thing, I mean, it was a shock, I'm sure, to everybody, but probably to me more than just about anyone else. I don't know. I mean, I, I was very good friends with this man and his family, and this just totally blindsided me. And uh, you know what? That's going to happen from time to time. Even though it blindsided me and it was totally unexpected, there's still always only going to be a limited amount of shock in general, because we're warned about this over and over and over again. We're, we're warned in Scripture. We're warned to take heed lest you fall. We're warned, you know, time and time again that people fall. We're warned about so many different things. It's sad, but it happens. And I'm not saying he's necessarily a wolf. I'm not saying that at all, but there are wolves. There are going to be other people. There are going to be deceivers. There's going to be people that come in and try to split churches and try to cause disruption for the work of Christ. We know that those things are going to happen. We know that Satan is working hard to destroy the hard work that's going on in reaching the loss with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it shouldn't come as, as a total shock when these types of things happen. Obviously, it's grievous when it happens and it's sad. Don't like to see it happen. But we also then can just turn around and take this and just look at it, look at it closely and see what can we learn about this and what can we take away, especially kind of knowing many people here are familiar with, with, with the man and with the church and with other things that have been going on. And what I want to teach on tonight is the root of all evil. It's something I haven't fully covered since this church started. And it's a very, very fundamental, important doctrine that we find here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I'm just going to read this one verse for you, though, in light of the things that happened. Ecclesiastes 9.18 says, Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. There is a lot of damage that one person can do to the cause of Christ. And we want to all keep that in mind. Because you, as, you know, as is evident, as we've already seen, you know, people oftentimes will think, well, it's just me. It's not that big of a deal. Well, I can just go off into my sin and everyone else can be fine. That's not the way it works. When you get into sin, you're going to end up doing much damage. And especially if you're someone, especially when you, if you're someone that's known to be a Christian, you're representing our Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. And people know, hey, that's a Christian person. Whether or not you're a pastor doesn't matter. Just anybody in your life, anyone in your, your field of, of influence, people who know who you are, family members, relatives, co-workers, whoever it is, that ought to know that you believe the Bible, you follow Jesus Christ. When you get yourself into sin, when you get into, into these matters and really just defile yourself, you destroy much good. One sinner can destroy a lot of good. Now, the Bible says here that the love of money is the root of all evil. And I have a couple other Bible versions here, especially if you're visiting for the first time. You may or may not be aware we are a King James Bible only church. We only use the King James Version of the Bible because we believe that that is the preserved word of God in the English language. Since we speak English here, that's what we have. We don't speak Greek. We don't speak Hebrew. We don't speak Spanish. I mean, some of us may a little bit here and there, but we are an English speaking church. So we have the word of God in our language and we thank God that he's preserved it for us today in the King James Bible. And the reason why I make a big deal out of this is because the other translations of the Bible in English literally say different things. And it's not just the these and the thou. So don't be deceived by people who say, oh, well, they just try to make it a little bit easier to read. They just modernize the language. That is not true. They may get rid of the these and thou, sure. I don't deny that. But there are so many places where verses are removed, where phrases are removed, where, where 
Verses literally say the exact opposite of each other. You cannot put two books side by side, call them both the Holy Bible, and if they have places where they say the exact opposite thing, say, well, they're both from God. Well, no, they're not. No, they're not. And God is the one who promised to preserve his word for us, and I believe he's kept his promise. Now, I'm not gonna, this isn't about a King James only sermon, but I like to bring up some of these issues just here and there as I preach when they're pertinent, when they're relevant. And I just want to point out here because this is a very important doctrine, the love of money being the root of all evil. And I'm going to explain that more in depth. But before I even get there, I just want to point out, I have here uh, a parallel Bible of the Living Bible and the NIV, which are both very uh, popular versions of the Bible that are widely used among Christians. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse number 10, the Living Bible says here, for the love of money is the first step toward all kinds of sin. That's not exactly the same thing as being the root of all evil. The root is the cause, it's the source. It's not just the first step towards, towards all kinds of sin, no, this book says it's the root. And in the NIV, it says in verse 10, for the love of money is, is a root of all kinds of evil. Now, I also have the new King James Version right here, and I'm not going to turn to it. I have it right here. You can check it out later. It basically says the same exact thing as the NIV. It's a root of all kinds of evil. There's a huge difference there because it's either the root or it's a root. I mean, would you say that would be a big deal if the Bible says where Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, as opposed to I am a way, a truth, and a life? They're two very different things. One is very exclusive, the way. And this may not have that much of an impact of, you know, about Jesus Christ being the Savior. However, the difference is still the same as far as using the words. It's either the root or it's just a root. It's just a cause, but then there's all these other causes. Well, which one is it? Which one's right? They can't both be right. And is it a cause of all evil? Or is it just many kinds of evil? No, the Bible says it's, all, it's the root of all evil. And, that's, and the reason why it's so important is because that's going to help us to take heed to the love of money, to covetousness, and to really, really be careful that we don't allow ourselves to go down that path because it's going to lead us into all manner of sin, all manner of evil, because that is the root. That is the source. When I heard about Pastor Romero at first, when I heard him stepping down and I heard you know, just the very beginning of what he was saying uh, before I got more details on it and say he wasn't real as house well and things like that, for some reason, the verse kept popping in, this verse kept popping in my head that the love of money is the root of all evil. And then it came to light later that he was involved in gambling. Like, oh, funny how that ties in. It's interesting how, how those things tie together. In addition to his adultery and, and you know, drunkenness and, and drug use and everything else. which, as I mentioned previously, those sins, those major sins, don't happen overnight. That's not something that you just, one day you're serving God, you're preaching, you're preaching the gospel, you know, you're living a holy life, you're doing good things, and then the next day it's like, oh, I just committed adultery. Oh, I'm calling up a prostitute. That does, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a long process, and see, the root of it is going to boil all the way down to when you get down to the base root of the matter, it's going to be a love of money. That's going to steer your heart away. And that's what happened in this case and, and, and all evil. Now, what's evil? Evil isn't necessarily all sin, just to be clear. Evil, in, in a biblical definition of evil, is when you do harm to someone else. Evil is like inflicting harm upon somebody. In the Bible, oftentimes, and sometimes evil isn't always sin. Now, what we're talking about is all, we're, we're, we're referring to sins in what this discussion is. 
But just to, to kind of help make it a little bit more clear what evil is, God brings evil on people sometimes, but we know that God doesn't sin. In the Old Testament, you'll see oftentimes that he was going to bring evil upon a people because they were going to be judged. So the evil that he thought to do unto Nineveh, for example, which is destroy Nineveh. So when you read in the book of, uh, of Jonah, the message is being preached, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was the message from God that, that uh, Jonah needed to preach unto the people there. But then what happened is the people received the message. They repented. They got right with God. And then God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do to them. So instead of bringing that judgment and destroying their city, because they got right with them, he changed his mind and said, okay, we won't do this anymore. So he didn't inflict evil upon them. If someone's carrying out the death sentence, for example, in a, in a righteous way, in, in the proper manner, where someone is guilty of a crime punishable by death, that person who, who does the execution does evil on that person, but they're not sinning. They're carrying out a sentence that's righteous and, and even commanded by God if it's done right. And, uh, and it's not a sin, but it is evil. So evil in this sense is, this is definitely referring to the, to the evil sins. But what would be an evil sin? It's when you're doing harm to someone. Think of, of, of sins where you're, you're hurting someone, like physically harming someone or doing things like, uh, um, you know, when, when a man forces a woman or something like that, you're, doing, you're inflicting evil on somebody. When, when you, um, you know, hurt someone, injure someone, things like that. Those types of sins where you are taking advantage of someone and hurting other people, the Bible is saying the, the source of that, the root of that is the love of money. It's a greed. We use the word greed more than anything else. See, I've heard, you know, the world gets this wrong. They say, oh, having money is a sin. They think like having money is a sin. The Bible doesn't teach that having money is a sin. The Bible doesn't teach that working a job and receiving money is a sin. That's not, that's not the sin. The sin is when you're loving that money. When that's what your heart and your desire is after that money. We all need money to survive. Everyone needs money to survive. But when you, when you turn that money, especially when you turn that money into your God, that's when you have a problem. The Bible teaches us the attitude that we need to have. Look at verse number six in 1 Timothy chapter six. The Bible says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So being godly, doing right things, and just being content with where you're at, whatever, whatever that may be, Wherever you are in life, just being content, being satisfied, being happy with where God has you. Whether you have a lot physically or have a lot uh, or have a little physically, like the, you know, physical riches, house, whatever. If you can just live right and do good and just be content with where you're at, the Bible says that's great gain. That is, a, that is a great gain for you to have that attitude. Way more of a gain than, any, than winning the, the lottery, right? It's way more gain to be just living right and just be content with what you have. Because people that aren't content, you're never going to be content. You're never going to be satisfied. When you love money, the thing is, the love of money, you can never fill that. Because no matter how much you get, when you love money, you're always just going to want more. And that void is never going to be filled. And people who love money are miserable people. And it's funny the way that works. Because oftentimes people who love money will amass a lot of money to themselves. And what the Bible calls it deceitfulness of riches because people will, other people will look at that that don't have all that money and be like, oh, wow, they have everything. That must be nice. Oh, it must be nice to have that. It must be and the people that have all that stuff, if they're lovers of money, they're miserable. That's not doing them any good at all. Now, not everybody that has riches is just loves money. So I want to throw that out there, too. Just because someone might be blessed with something, you know, blessed with goods, doesn't mean that they're automatically just a lover of money and just super greedy. But um, what we need to be worried about is ourselves and not worried about what other people have. Be content with where we're at 
and not be seeking after to love money. Let's look at verse number seven. It says, for we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. First of all, it doesn't even mean anything is what he's saying. We didn't come into this world with anything. We're definitely not bringing it with us. So who cares? Our life is but a vapor. It appeareth for a short time and then vanisheth away. We are, we, in the sense of eternity, this is a drop in the bucket, not even a drop in the bucket. The time that's spent here. So who cares how much money you accumulate? That's not what life is all about. It's all going to be, it's all going to burn up and be gone anyways. We didn't, you can't take it with you. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. There's that word again, content, being satisfied. Do you have food? Do you have clothing? That's what raiment is. Being clothed, being fed. Notice it doesn't say, do you have a cell phone? Do you have a, you know, say, Pastor Burns, they didn't have cell phones back then. Do you have a house? Do you have a horse? They didn't say those things. All right, I was going to say car, but, you know, to try to keep it with the times there. It, it doesn't say if you have those things, then you can be with content. No. Basically, it's saying, do you have what you need to survive, which is food and clothing? You need clothing to protect yourself from the environment and you need food. If you've got those things, be satisfied. And if God chooses to bless you, God will bless you. And if not, praise the Lord. Job had the best attitude of contentment that we could find in Scripture. He was someone who was blessed by God by having lots of this world's goods and riches. He was a very rich man. He had lots of cattle and sheep and all, you know, and, and children and, and everything that he, could, that he could want. And he was a godly man and he feared the Lord. And then all of that was taken away from him. Every single last bit. He lost all of his wealth and he lost his children. And he was diseased. But what was his attitude? The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He said, Bless God. Praise God. Naked came I into this world, naked shall I return thither. It's the same attitude as being taught right here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's the attitude that we need to have. It's a godly attitude. And when we start straying away from having this type of an attitude, we're going to start getting ourselves into sin and getting ourselves into other sins. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 9. But... They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Will means you want to be. If you have a will to be rich, doesn't say you might fall, doesn't say it's possible that something bad will happen. It says they fall. They that will be rich, you want to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare. A snare is a trap. You're just falling into a trap. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Think about that, being drowned. I mean, you're just sinking and totally being drowned, in being destroyed, and in perdition, in sins and lusts. That's what happens when you, when you, get it, when you start getting a greedy heart. You start loving money. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Many people have fallen into that trap and you are not immune just because you're saved just because you believe God, just because you have the Holy Spirit. That doesn't make you immune to loving money. And once you start loving money, get ready to be pierced with many sorrows. Not with one, many sorrows. Why? Because you're going to fall into many hurtful and deceitful lusts. And it's just going to destroy you. Because sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. 
But verse 11 says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. That is where your focus needs to be. And of course, this is an epistle to Timothy, who is a man of God. And Apostle Paul is admonishing Timothy, saying, hey, thou, you, man of God, you, you run away from this stuff. You run away from this desire to have money and be greedy and make it all about the money and think, how can I make more money and what can I do for myself? And, and you know, it's going to lead you to gambling and prostitutes and, and all manner of evil and wickedness. Flee those things. Get, get as far away from that as possible. You need to not care at all about money. It means it mean nothing to you. But too many times the temptation becomes great. And I think what happened in that situation is, is pro most likely a result of maybe not, that wasn't the original intent. Because you see, false prophets have an intent of of stealing money and making merchandise of people. Actually, turn, if you would, to um, 2 Peter chapter 2. So just go a forward in your Bible a little bit from 1 Timothy to 2 Peter chapter 2. Because there's a, there's a big association of false prophets with the love of money. Verse number one in Second Peter chapter two says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. This is talking about false prophets. They bring in damnable heresies. They creep in. They want to make themselves sound good and sound great and, and put themselves off as being these Christians. But their ways are pernicious and by reason of them, because they're false prophets, because they deceive, because they love money, the way of truth the Bible, God's way, is evil spoken of. Christianity gets a bad rap because you've got false prophets out there that only care about the money. Christianity gets a bad rap. One of the things I dealt with a lot in Prescott Valley was the CFM Ministries, which was the Potter's House. It's this Pentecostal church that they talk about money all the time. I mean, you show up to a church service, you're probably going to hear something about tithing. Some about, oh, you got to give money. You know, let's pass the plate around three times and, and make everyone feel guilty if you're not putting money in that plate. And it's all about the money. Look, we've all experienced or heard about these churches where the, you know, these preachers, just all, the, all they care about is money. They're false prophets. I mean, look at the Joel Osteens of the world. That's his multimillionaire that'll never preach on sin, never say anything to possibly offend somebody. Which, you know what, if you never say that, you're not reading the Bible, or at least you're not preaching the Bible. Go ahead and just read the Bible out loud in today's society and try not to offend somebody. Impossible. Not going to happen. If you read the whole Bible out loud, just read it out loud in a public place and just start reading from Genesis 1 and how long is it going to take before someone gets offended at what you're saying. These guys that seem to be able to please everybody and everybody loves and they have their multi-million dollar mansions and boats, you know what they're doing? They're deceiving people. They don't care about people. If you cared about people, you'd tell them what's wrong in their life. You'd tell them about the sins. You'd tell them to get right with God. You'd tell them we need to fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Instead of telling them how great they are and just keep on giving me money, Through covetousness shall they with feigned words. What does feign mean? It's deceitful. They don't really care about it. They're, they're just saying whatever they want. Fake words. They're just faking it to make merchandise of you. They don't care about you. They care about your wallet and they care about your money. Verse 
false prophets are often associated with that level of greed. They don't care about people, they just care about that love of money and they've given themselves over to that. Which is why you also find out that these, these false prophets are into all kinds of other sin, not just ripping people off. There's always other sins going on behind that. Now again, in the situation that I'm tying this in with, I'm not saying that Pastor Romero was a, you know, was a, is a reprobate or false prophet, but that is a, a, a characteristic of the false prophet. And it still it, it demonstrates the danger of such a sin. Uh, turn, if you would, to, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to see the requirements of a pastor, of a bishop, in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is spelled out in Scripture that when you're trying to identify who should we have to pastor a church, you need to find someone who's not greedy, who doesn't love money. Because that will defile them, that will corrupt them, that will make them not a good leader. They will not be able to preach the word of God if they love money. Look at verse number one in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach not given to wine, no striker. Look at this, not greedy of filthy lucre. Lucre is just money. But patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of, a devil, of the devil. Very, very serious criteria being laid forth here. And I'm not going to get into all the requirements, but every single one of those requirements is important. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in Scripture. Holding the office as a man of God, which is, again, Timothy was a man of God and he was receiving instruction from the Apostle Paul and being, and being told and warned, saying, look, this is a true saying of a man desire of a bishop. He desires a good work. This is how a bishop needs to be. If you're going to do a good work, if you're going to hold that position, if you're going to be, hold the trust of people and have their confidence and lead them and instruct them and guide them in the ways of the Lord, then you have to have all of these things. And if you don't have any one of them, you're not qualified. If you have greed, if you have covetousness, if you're a striker, if you're given to wine, you cannot be a pastor. You cannot be a bishop. Same thing, interchangeable words. This is taught even in the Old Testament. Uh, turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 7. I'm going to read this for you in Exodus chapter 18. Exodus 18, 19, the Bible says, Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. So in, in the context here, this is Moses' father-in-law instructing him because Moses was hearing all the concerns of all the children of Israel. When he was judging the children of Israel, like everybody, all the smallest matters, it doesn't matter what it was, everybody came to Moses, and Moses is just like, you know, this is too much of a weight. There's, there's, everybody's coming to me. He's like, from, from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, this is what I do all the time. Because he felt like he had to do everything. And his father-in-law is instructing him here, but, and, and instructing him wisely. And this is the reason why we see it in Scripture. He's, he's giving him good advice. And he's saying that Moses needs to be for the people to God word that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. Verse 20 says, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness 
and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. So he's saying, you need to get other people involved in this and, and just kind of rank people there, you know, this person's going to be over thousands, this person's going to be over hundreds, this person's going to be over tens. And basically, you start at the low level with all the small issues. You got some little minor issue, you know, they're already instructed in the law and how things need to go. Go, you know, start at the bottom of the chain and work your way up. And then the real difficult problems where people are just like, yeah, we don't, we don't quite know. This, this has a lot of nuances. There's a lot of variables here. You know, we're not quite sure how God's word should be applied to this situation. Those are the ones that Moses has to deal with. But the reason, you know, that's what's going on here. But what he's saying is you need to find the people to be judges that could even handle those smaller tasks that are not covetous people that that are right people that are going to be capable of judging appropriately men of truth they have to hate covetousness why because if someone has that covetous attitude or they're greedy they can be turned they can be persuaded they, they can be bribed right they're not going to judge righteously if they care about money the reason why a pastor can't be covetous, can't be greedy, well, what happens when you've got the guys in here that are putting all the, you know, the majority of the money in the offering plate? Well, all of a sudden now, you might not want to preach the things that are going to offend those people because you care about their money coming in instead of caring about them and say, hey, if this offends them and they leave, either way, I need to let them know because I actually care about them. And when you come to this church, you may hear things that offend you. And I don't say things that are offensive to try to offend you. If they're offensive, I'm not even the one that makes it offensive. I'm just trying to preach God's word. And it's not because I have it out for anybody. If I'm, you know, I'm not picking on anybody when I preach, whatever it is I preach. I'm trying to preach the whole counsel of God because that's my job. And if it offends the person that gives the most money in this church, so be it. And if they leave, fine. I don't want you to leave. I don't want anyone to leave. I want everyone to stay and to grow and get right with God. But that's the goal. But if I care about your money and if I care about being, you know, being covetous, that's not going to work. I can't do my job, at least the job that God wants me to do. And that goes for all judgment. All judges. That's why you can't have corrupt judges even in, in their criminal court system. Because what happens when they're judging a case of well, some corporation that's got all this money and they're just they're getting grease, they're getting, you know, these these bribes. Then proper judgment doesn't take place. They're just bought and paid for. That's why you can't have someone who's greedy and covetous in those positions. Because then you won't have the right judgment being, uh, being taken care of. Now, in, in the case of Donnie Romero, I don't think he started off that way. But what happens is, I think, you know, he got popular and was receiving a lot of donations, especially online. And all of a sudden, there's, this, there's all this money here. And having that whole pot of money just kind of sitting there probably is what turned his heart. I don't know. It's conjecture, but... It seems to make sense to me. And I'm not going to get into, you know, I, I don't want to preach hearsay because I've heard a lot of different things, but it all makes sense to me. Either way, regardless of specifically what happened in his situation, the Bible is still true. And what it says about loving money being the root of all evil. And I believe that to be a fact. And when people going around and hurting other people and bringing evil upon people and bringing evil upon their wife because they commit adultery against them, that starts with the love of money. The love of money is a very selfish sin. It's a very self-centered. You're focused on yourself because you care about gratifying. You know, why do you want the money for? For yourself. 
to gratify yourself. When you love money and you just want to have that, you want things, you want to have stuff for you. And when that becomes your God, as we're going to see in Scripture, you know, the Bible says that you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't. Because either you're going to love the one and hate the other, or I'll just, I'll, I got the quote in here. Um, I was going to get to this later, but no man can serve two masters. It's in Matthew 6, 24. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon's money is in. You're either going to have, like, you know, basically God can't be your God if you're looking to serve money. If you're looking to just, just have this greedy attitude where you care just about get, making money. You can't serve two masters. It's one or the other. And once someone, especially a man of God, starts loving money, they can't serve God. Now their heart is after that money. And because they can't serve God, they're not going to be walking in the spirit of God either. They're walking in the flesh. And then the more you're walking in the flesh, now you're into all kinds of, you start getting into all kinds of other sins. I had to turn somewhere. Mark chapter 7, right? And by the way, the Bible teaches us that God hates covetous people. And I'll read this for you in Psalm 10.3. If you want to write down the reference, you can look it up later. Psalm 10.3 says, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous. So this is talking about a wicked person. They boast of their heart's desire, what their heart's want. They brag about it. And they bless covetous people. A wicked person is just, oh man, the blessings on the most covetous people, people who want things that they can't have. It says, whom the Lord abhorreth. God hates the covetous. And notice it says, whom, whom the Lord abhorreth. Hate the sin, love the sinner is a Gandhi quote, not a scripture quote. Now, there's many places in the Bible where it talks about hating sin, but there are places in the Bible where it talks about God hating people. And to deny that is just to deny scripture. I mean, as much as you might not want to believe that or as much as you might have heard otherwise, the Bible says, for the wicked boast of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. Abhorring is hating. I didn't write the book. I'm just going to preach through it. Mark chapter 7, verse number 18, the Bible says, And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart? but into the belly and goeth out into the draft, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. That's a heart problem. Covetousness, adulteries, all these sins, it's a heart problem. We need to guard our hearts. We need to get our hearts right. We need to make sure that we're not allowing ourselves to get our hearts set on the things of this world, get our hearts set on earning or making a whole bunch of money. Beware. Don't be deceived with the riches of this world. You don't need them. Don't fall into the trap of thinking I need to make all this money. Then everything will be okay. You're already going down the wrong path. You don't need to make all that money. You don't. If you, want, if you need to have all the stuff, you need to make a bunch of money. 
You don't need the stuff. Whatever you have, whatever God has blessed you with, whatever job you have, be content with that. Because when you're discontent with that, you are going to be drowned in perdition and sorrows and you will, not be, you will not have peace, you will not have happiness, you will not have joy. It won't come. You're going to be stressed out all the time and focused on the wrong things. It's going to take you away from serving the Lord and you're going to serve money. Don't fall into the trap. Get out of it before things get worse. That's not what life is about. Who cares? We shouldn't care. The Bible says in Luke 12, 15, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Life is not about what you have. That's not what it's all about. Take heed and beware. It's warning. And but that's the words of Jesus Christ when he was on this earth teaching. One of the things that he felt was so important to get across and is recorded for us in the Gospels. Because think about it. He lived on this, on this earth for what, 33 and a half years, roughly, somewhere around that time frame? And what we have recorded for us is... I've got this really big Bible, so it's harder to illustrate, but, <laughs> you know, when, when you just look at the Gospels of, of the words that are recorded, that came out of his mouth, it's not a lot. Now, now, we're taught in the book of John that, hey, if you were to, you know, if books were to be written about all the works that he did, you know, the world couldn't contain him. He did a lot while he was on this earth, okay? But we're given a, rel a very relatively small amount of just his sayings, words, everything. We're given what he wants us to have, though. And one of those statements that's repeated is warning, he's saying, take heed and beware. I want to make sure you guys know this. Take heed and beware. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That's not what life's about. You want to know the answers to life? Jesus already told us. Don't get caught up into this stuff. And it's repeated over and over and over again in Scripture. This is one of those fundamentals, one of those key things that we need to keep ourselves right with on a regular basis. Not to get caught up in this. Because we live in a society that's going to tell you you need to have this stuff. You need to have the newest cell phone. You need to have the best computer. You need to have all this digital technology. You've got to have the fancy car. You've got to have the fancy house and the boat and everything else. You need to have all this stuff. That's what you're being told and programmed into through media, through every single avenue. You have to have all this stuff. It's the exact opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says you don't have to have any of it. You know, you have to have food. You know, you have to have clothing. Guess what? Everybody here has those things. Guaranteed. I don't even know everybody here, but I see that everybody's clothed and nobody looks that hungry to me right now. And if you're hungry, we got food on that back table. All right, help yourself. <laughs> and praise God, you have what you need. Bl praise God for that. And let's be content. You know what? There's a great joy to being content. It is. It is one of the best feelings. You know, it, it's not the, the flashy thing. It's not what everyone's going to get all excited about. But man, it's one of the best feelings in the world. Just to be satisfied. To be able to go home, sit down with your family or whoever, and not worry about stressing out over how much money we make or anything. You know what? Just be content. Praise God. Here we are. Thank God for what we have. So many fights and strifes and problems come from, oh, we need to have this and we need to have that. No, you don't. No, we don't. 
look, I've been there. I'm not perfect either. Okay, I've had the same types of problems, but we need to keep on guard against this and continually get ourselves in check. What do we need? What's important? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. I quoted the one verse, but I, I want to get the whole thing in context here. We're almost done. The Bible teaches the love of money is the root of all evil. Why is that the root? Because your love, or your desire, is what's going to drive your path in life. The thing that you love and the thing that you want, that's, those are going to be the things that you do. It's going to steer your course. So when you love money, that's what you're putting as, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that. When you love God, you're going to do whatever it takes to do the things of God. You're going to do things the right way. When you love money, and that's what you place to basically be your God, that's where people fall into these traps and start. Then all of a sudden, you know, you might have had morals. Well, where do your morals come from? Your morals come from God. When you love money, it turns into the dog-eat-dog -dog world, Right? You start doing some shady things. You start, you start stealing from people, whatever, right? Hurting other people because you have the attitude that only we're, we're ultimately, as you continue down that path, you matter. You matter more than anyone else. The Bible teaches you to, to humble yourself and esteem other better than yourself to be selfless like Jesus Christ was. He didn't come to this earth to be ministered unto, but to minister. He ministered unto other people. When you're greedy and covetous, you think about and care about yourself. You put yourself first. When you have the attitude of Jesus Christ, other people come first, you come last. Completely opposite. The love of money is the root of all evil. Look at Matthew 6, verse number 19. The Bible says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Again, this is Jesus Christ. Again, more words from Jesus Christ himself. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. He's saying you can't even, you can't love God and money. You say, well, I love both. Not according to Jesus. <laughs> no, you don't. You can only love one or the other. It is impossible because they're diametrically opposed to one another. The love of money and the love of God. Complete opposites. It, by loving one, you inherently have to hate the other one. You can't love both. Just like you can't love children and pedophiles can't love them both. I mean, you have, to, you have to choose one or the other. Because inherently, you're, if you love one, you have to hate the other one. That's just the way it is. I mean, it's, that's, that's a fact. And that's the way that Jesus is saying, hey, you can't love money and love God. It's impossible. If you love God, you've got you've to not love money at all. You've just got to hate him, just whatever. It's a tool, it is what it is, but I don't, I don't love it. I don't care about it. Last place I'll have you turn is Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, we'll get some instruction, some further instruction on what we need to do. The reason why you're here today, I believe, is because you love God. That's why I'm here today. I love God and I love you. That's why I show up to church. And I believe it's the same way for you. And that's great. Amen. 
let's continue with that heart and that attitude and apply that not just for Sunday at 4 p.m. and not just apply that Sunday at 10.30 or Wednesday at 7 or whatever you show up. Let's apply that 24-7. When we're out of here, when we're in our personal life. Let's continue to keep a love for God in our life. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1. The Bible says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become its saints. This shouldn't even be named among you. These are some grievous sins. Fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness. Desiring to have the things you can't have. Being greedy. Don't even let that be once named among you as become its saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. You know, you know what it takes to give thanks? It's to be humble. You know what people aren't humble do? They'll say, I deserve that. I'm entitled to that. How about just be thankful for what you have? Let's give thanks to God instead of complaining to God. We see a lot of complaining in the Old Testament of the children of Israel, complaining about what God's given them. Complaining about this manna. Oh, this, we have to eat this manna every day. It's a miracle that you've even got the manna. It's a miracle God provided for you. You don't have to do any work for it. You step outside and you just collect it and eat it. You ungrateful bunch of people. But it's easy to point the finger at them and say, oh yeah, they're ungrateful. Why don't you look at yourself? Where are you being ungrateful to God for where you're at? And you start getting bitter and discontent with what you have and where you're at. Because that's what really matters to you is not what the children of Israel did. Why don't you look at what they did and say, how am I being like them? Because wherever you're at, God's provided that for you. The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above from the Father of lights. Your breath is in God's hand. He gives you your breath every day. Let's not forget that and get puffed up. Verse number five, for this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Don't let people deceive you with meaningless, that's what vain means, meaningless, just, just these empty words to try to convince you that, oh, these things aren't that bad, right? Oh, being a whoremonger is really not that big of a deal, or, or committing adultery, or, you know, being covetous. Well, everybody's covetous. It's not that big. It's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that bad of a sin. Don't be deceived. Because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Like, that is why God gets really angry and pours out his wrath on people. So don't be deceived because it is a big deal. Verse 7, be not ye therefore partakers with them. You let other people do that. Don't, don't you be a partaker with them. You don't want to be around when God's pouring out his wrath. Verse number eight. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Reprove them means tell them they're wrong. It doesn't mean don't say anything. It means reprove them. It means tell them they're wrong. No, that's not the right way. Oppose. Stand up for what's right. Say something about it. 
at least if you're going to follow what the Scripture is saying. Verse 12, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done to them in secret, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Praise God for that. And, and remember that too. It's another admonishment. You know what? The light, God is going to shed light on all the secret sins. They're all going to be uncovered. They're all going to be made known. So you might as well not try to hide anything right now and just do what's right. Because then when the light shines on it, you got nothing to worry about. You don't have to fear the light. You can actually walk in the light and walk with a clear conscience and have love and joy and peace and contentment which comes with walking in the Spirit. Gentleness, goodness, faith. Boy, doesn't that sound good? It's the way I want to live my life. It's not flashy. It's not exciting. But it's about probably the best thing that you could experience. It really is. Because all those things that the world says are flashy and exciting and where you want to be, it's a, it's a snare. It's a trap. It's not what it's cracked up to be. It comes with all kinds of sorrows that are going to pierce you through and drown you in perdition. Let's walk as children of light. Let's take the heat. Let's look at the warnings around us. Let's look at people who have already succumbed to that and decide I'm not going to be that I'm not going to be that person I'm not going to let that swallow me up I'm going to get my attitude right I'm not going to have a covetous attitude a covetous heart greedy I'm going to thank God today for where I am and what I have and what he's blessed me with and I'm going to focus more about laying up my treasure in heaven and serving him than I am about laying up my treasures on this earth where I can't take it with me anyways and I'm going to start to live that, that life that's going to bring me contentment and bring me joy and bring me happiness. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for providing us with such great wisdom. Lord, I thank you that you love us enough to tell us these great truths that we don't have to just go out and experience everything for ourselves in order to understand the truth of these things. Lord, help us to be able to, to apply your words to our lives and to make corrections where we need to make them, Lord, in our attitudes. And God, we live in a dark world and, and we have so many influences about us and so many um, people trying to convince us to buy things and, and philosophies of men that are going to tell us that we need all this stuff, Lord. Help us to just get in your words and, and to um, just be content with where we're at and not to be complainers and murmurers, but... Um, Rather, just be content and, and look to serve you. And so, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.